oftentimes that is a period where you'll see these type of moves get ready and kind of initiate. So, so I would be kind of surprised if we don't have a move up on Bitcoin in the next week, week and a half back to at least 25,000. Yeah. So, um, so I mean, I, I think let's start with cryptocurrency. I think, I think it's kind of an interesting period in crypto because we've just seen that big flush that took us below 20,000 to about 17.5. And then very quickly, the next day we recovered back above the 2017 highs. So I think for me, that's the line in the sand right now is that you can go below a previous pivot high, a major level like that. But the recovery is important. If we didn't recover and we were still below that level, it would signal near-term weakness. Right now, I actually think that we're in a position to maybe see a bounce over the next week or two, potentially back to 25,000, maybe as high as 28 plus thousand um, before, unfortunately, we probably see a little bit more downside. Yeah, so so right now there's kind of this time factor involved where, where we got below that previous 2017 high, we recovered with a reversal candle, which is a technical bullish signal. And now we've just been going sideways. It's been very, very eerily quiet in the crypto markets, but we've started to see some altcoins starting to pick up. You know, for instance, we've seen a Polygon have a monster move. In fact, let me bring up that chart here on Polygon. Okay. So you could see this move on Polygon. It's just been ripping up to the upside. You know, it got as low as about 30 cents. So it's up about 100%. And then if you look at other names, like, like even Solana has been showing us some relative strength breaking up here off of these recent lows. So even though Bitcoin hasn't started to really rip to the upside, some of these more beaten down altcoins are. And I look at them as kind of a little bit of a leading indicator. I think if you go back to Solana, for instance, when Bitcoin was topping, this was still holding up relatively well before it really started to fall dramatically. So, so it makes sense to me that these could be showing a little bit of a risk on um, kind of take on the crypto markets. And that could be telling us that Bitcoin could likely get a bounce in the next week. In addition, I think it's important to recognize that the NASDAQ 100 is having another monster day. We know that, you know, as much as we don't in the crypto markets like to say that crypto and stocks are connected, they are, frankly. They're very it's correlated. Risk, yeah, it's, it's definitely a risk on trade, whether it's technology stocks or crypto. And therefore, when you're starting to see the NASDAQ rip up, it's telling me that the risk on environment is starting to percolate again. And that's a positive for Bitcoin. Um, one of the things to keep in mind, we're coming into the July 4th holiday week next week, going into the weekend. And oftentimes that is a period where you'll see these type of moves get ready and kind of initiate. So, so I would be kind of surprised if we don't have a move up on Bitcoin in the next week, week and a half back to at least 25,000. Yeah. So, so interestingly enough, if you go back to last October and November, everyone was always asking me, well, what's the catalyst for this kind of flush out? What's going to happen here? And one of the things that I, I was comparing the, the crypto markets to was the dot com bubble. Right. So this is taking us back to the late 90s, early 2000s, where you had a very similar scenario with with dot com companies where there were so many of them. And, and I mean, I kid you not, some of these these dot coms were like run out of their parents basement. They basically did nothing, but they got ridiculous valuations. You would see a stock that was a, a few pennies a share go to 10 cents, go to 50 cents, go to three dollars. I mean, it would become a mega sized company that almost did nothing and really had no business being a legitimate stock. And, and we saw a lot of this in crypto, right? You've seen so many coins. I mean, now what do we have? 20,000 coins out there and it's just not a healthy environment. So, so you, you know, one of the things I said back then is you need a deleveraging event. Yeah. I mean, the bottom line is, is, is you, there's not space. I mean, think about overpopulation or the Darwinian impact. And I, I love referring it to Darwin, Darwin and, and kind of survival of the fittest in terms of genetics, because it, it really does play a role here where there's just so much and you need to see that wash out occur. So the fact that we're seeing Terra Luna collapse, we saw the UST, we saw the Celsius. I mean, this is exactly what actually should be happening. And it's not over yet, right? I mean, when you, you really need to see that when the dust settles, I mean, really about only five to 10% of cryptos should really have a functional, decent market cap after this, you know, otherwise, otherwise, I just don't think it's over yet. 
So, so I think in, in regards to the Federal Reserve, you're right in that there's likely another 50 basis point hike coming in the next meeting, maybe one after that. But, but I've long said that I do think that that will end very, very quickly because you know the midterms obviously generally you'll see the federal reserve historically not do a lot of crazy monetary policy just before elections whether it's a republican or democrat because they don't want uh, a market crash or anything to be looked at and said oh well you guys are the reason this happened right so they kind of like to remove themselves out of the equation now having said that i think the tightening has been on purpose to bring down inflation and mainly oil right so tightening of interest rates slows the economy that's that's what it does um, because it sucks money out of the system so less money to spend less money to go around it slows the system down and basically that'll slow the demand for oil so oil comes down we've already seen oil this week i think the high was around 124 dollars a barrel and we're right now around 106 so you're starting to see oil come down my guess is oil will continue to come down because the economy will continue to slow so I think that's part of the equation here, where once you get inflation to start coming down, the Fed will have that leniency to kind of step back for a few months right around those midterms and kind of recognize or see how things are playing out. And then really what I what I honestly expect is by year end, the U.S. economy is borderline recession. Early 2023, we are in a recession. And then you see the Fed potentially, especially if, if inflation starts to come in back to four to five percent, then you could see the Federal Reserve actually start to loosen again. Um, one of the things I've kind of said is, is that you have the Federal Reserve dealing with a scale, right? So on one side, you have inflation. On the other side is their other mandate, which is unemployment. Right now, unemployment is super low. Inflation is super high, right? So, so you, have, you have one really high. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to bring the scale back down and rotate it. Now, as unemployment starts to spike up and inflation comes down to, let's say, 4 to 5%, now they're going to say, wait a minute. Now the scales are tipped the other way too much. We need to kind of stimulate the economy and we'll deal with a 4 to 5% inflation rate, which stinks. Like, I mean, let's be honest. You know, I, I liked it when it was two to zero percent, frankly. I think a lot of Americans did. But that's now the new game. The new game is kind of whack-a-mole where it's which one is the worst case here and then let's do the opposite. So in, if inflation then spikes up again, they'll raise interest rates. If unemployment spikes up, they'll lower interest rates and stimulate. And it just goes back and forth. And this is not good for Americans. This is not good for the world. This is kind of the beginning of the end, in my opinion, of the dollar of the US financial system and and it's going to take time but my guess is in 10 years we're talking about a new reserve currency of the world whether it's the digital yuan or something else um so it's kind of the demise it's the beginning of the end of the of the financial system in the US the way it is now I, I think eventually it will, right? So so you're going to get in this kind of, you know, back and forth with the Fed where they're going to tolerate slightly higher employment, un, excuse me, higher inflation to and still be willing to stimulate because they don't want to let us fall into this depression. And, and I think that's going to be the kicker is that they're going to continue to try to do that, but then it's going to keep inflation elevated four, five, six, seven percent while they're doing you know this avoidance of a depression and eventually there's no good outcome here you have to have that global reset that us reset where everything just finally collapses and again think about it like keeping keeping a patient on life support right you're doing everything you can you know they start to flatline you do this then they start to flatline you put you know put this drug in them you're doing whatever you can to kind of keep them alive but inevitably if they keep flatlining, they're going to go, right? And then that's the U.S. economy at this point where, where you'll get to a point where you do get to that next Great Depression. And again, okay. one thing to always remember, and this kind of sucks, but they say every generation has to go through a Great Depression. And again, if you think about the last one was in the 1930s, uh, there aren't a lot of Americans left alive that remember the lessons from that. Remember, and my, my grandmother's a great, a great example of this. Uh, she's passed away, but but she went through that and she was so, even though they had, a, my, my grandparents had a fair amount of money, but she was so careful with money because she lived through the Great Depression and she took those lessons with her. And I think it's important to recognize that Americans no longer kind of abide by those same things. I mean, we have credit cards, we have, you know, yeah. huge mortgages, we're willing to do whatever and just spend, spend, spend. The consumer's always spending. And I think that that again is something that's not sustainable long-term.